All right. Well, welcome, everybody. We appreciate you being here for our next installment in the uh, Arkansas Native Plant Society webinar series. We're very excited to have Grace MacArthur here today uh, to talk about the uh, the flora of the lower Mississippi River Islands. Uh, it's an exciting uh, area of research that she is pursuing there as a graduate student at the Arkansas State University in Jonesboro. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and afterwards the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if there's anything you wanna go back and see, um, just know that it should be up there. Uh, you should try to get them up there on the same day um, uh, as the actual uh, webinar. So check back later today and you'll probably find it uh, available for you to review. If you'd like to learn more about the Arkansas Native Plant Society, you can do so by visiting our website at amps.org. Uh, joining the society is simple. Just go to amps.org slash join, uh, where you can use your PayPal account to join online, or you can find the address to mail uh, a check uh, for uh, membership dues. And there's all different kinds of um, uh, options for how long uh, you can be a lifetime member or just uh, pay for a year, um, that sort of thing. So. Uh, I'll also be placing the links uh, for these in the chat here shortly, so uh, if you missed that, no worries, uh, you'll have a chance to uh, click on those links, um, as well as the link to our YouTube channel. Uh, upcoming in our webinar series next month, Saturday, August 13th at 10 a.m., uh, Katie Sims will be talking about uh, her research, uh, tracking the phenology of herbaceous species on Buck Island in the Mississippi River. And then in September, September 3rd at 10 a.m., uh, Nate Weston uh, of the Beaver Watershed Alliance, he, and, uh, who is also the current president of the Arkansas Native Plant Society, will be talking about the biodiversity and role of disturbance in managing natural ecosystems. And that was a webinar that we had originally scheduled for uh, earlier in the year, but I believe Nate had come down uh, with, with uh, illness and uh, had to uh, reschedule. So we're, we're excited to be able to have him back uh, for that. So, all right, and our speaker today, Grace MacArthur, is originally from South Carolina, which is where she received her Bachelor of Science in Biology from uh, Furman University. From there, she worked in northern New Mexico at uh, Bandelier National Monument as a fire ecology intern. After two years, she moved to Arkansas to pursue, pursue her Master of Science in Biological Sciences with an emphasis in botany at the Arkansas State University, and she will be graduating here uh, in August 2022, so next month. So uh, if anybody is looking for a bright young botanist to join their team, uh, just I know Grace would appreciate anybody that would want to reach out and offer her a job. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Grace. So uh, Grace, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. So, hi everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Grace MacArthur and I'm a master's student at Arkansas State, finishing up my thesis. And it's actually due to my committee on Tuesday, so coming up really soon. Um, my research was all about the plant communities on the lower Mississippi River Islands. And in this picture, um, you can see our little John boat um, that we drove all over the river. Um, parked on the bank of one of our islands that's outside of Greenville, Mississippi. Okay. okay. So Eric already introduced me a little bit, but I um, have this little about me page just to give some background on myself. Um, so as he said, I'm from South Carolina. I got my bachelor's at Furman University in biology, and then I worked as a fire ecology intern at Bandelier National Monument in uh, Los Alamos, New Mexico. And then I came here to work on my master's. Um, in these pictures, you can see my immediate family up here, my sisters and brother and parents. Um, and then this picture with this poster, I'm presenting this research at the, at the International Biogeography Society Conference in Vancouver. Um, our lab went there in June to present um, our research. And then I have my, a picture of my cat down here, Callie. Um, she might be interrupting us today, but hopefully not. Um, and then a picture of me and my partner, Tim. So I'm part of uh, Travis Marcico's lab group at Arkansas State. Uh, many of you probably know or know of Travis. Um, he's the most wonderful advisor. And pictured here are some of my fellow Marcico lab mates, um, Ben Benton, Brendan Kosnick, and Matthew Jones. Um, 
and Katie Sims. So here we are in the field on one of the islands, and then here we are at the Vancouver conference. So they have helped a lot with this island research, so I wanted to make sure to go ahead and mention them up front. So a quick overview of my research. For the first part of my thesis, I, with the help of my lab mates, conducted a flora of six lower Mississippi River islands, just to create a formal list of the species that are present on them, um, because the flora of the, of the lower Mississippi River islands hadn't really been done yet. And then for the second part of my thesis, I surveyed plots on the islands to learn about the structure of the plant communities and what factors are most influential in creating those different communities. And here's a picture of um, the southern part of one of our islands, Lake Fort Towhead. Now I'm going to jump into some background information. So the Mississippi River is um, a very large river in North America and drains about 41% of the land area uh, of the contiguous U.S. And here you can see the complete watershed. Um, it's quite impressive and very far reaching. And the lower Mississippi River is the section of river south of Cairo, Illinois, um, or south of the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. Um, and, and it's also important to know that the river has an annual flood cycle where the highest waters are typically seen in the winter and summer months and the lowest waters are seen in the summer and fall months. And when the river, level, when the river levels are too high, it's not as safe to boat out to the islands, so we had to watch the river gauges really carefully during our um, field seasons. So the modern Mississippi River has been extensively altered by humans. The river training structures pictured here are very common on the lower Mississippi River. Uh, wing dikes are these structures that run perpendicular to the main channel, and they direct water towards the middle of the channel to make it deeper for navigation. Uh, and sediment commonly builds up behind these wing dikes, and they um, have in fact played a large part in forming some islands. Then levees pictured in the middle um, surround the river on both sides to keep the river from flooding people and property. However, they also cut off the river from much of its historic floodplain. So that means the, that the river islands are important remaining floodplain habitat. And then revetments are built along the river banks to help prevent erosion and channel migration. So this picture on the left shows how, shows really well how sediment can build up behind wing dikes. Um, we can see an island with some vegetation starting to form here. Um, three, of our, three of our study islands were formed um, around, or at least with the help of wing dikes, and our other three study islands formed from sediment building up behind um, steamboat wrecks, actually. So this picture on the right shows a sunken boat on the bottom of the river at low water level, and you can see some sediment starting to build up um, behind that boat. So islands in the Mississippi River have been around for a long time, and they used to be formed naturally, um, not by humans. Um, this research paper in 2019 that I found really interesting studied how the island area has changed in the lower Mississippi over time. Um, so this plot shows the cumulative island area. Um, they, it shows that it has increased since 1965. So the axis on the left is cumulative island area, and then the axis on the bottom is distance downstream from Cairo, Illinois. The top line of dots is cumulative island area in 2015, and then the bottom row of dots is cumulative island area um, in 1965. So we can see that the overall island area has increased a lot. And then this this graph um, on the right tells us that though total island area and the total number of islands is increasing over time, the average area per island is decreasing. 
So the, these uh, light colored bars on the left sides um, is the number of islands. And we can see that it has increased from 1965 to 2015. And then the darker bar on the right is um, total island area. And we can see that it has also increased. And then the bar in the middle is average island area. And we can see that it has decreased from um, 1965 to 2015. So though the number of islands has increased, they're on average smaller than they used to be. Um, so I chose to study some of the largest river islands in our section of the river so that I could hopefully see the full range of habitats and species that these islands have to offer. The size of our study islands is uh, still quite varied though. So the largest island, um, Choctaw Bar, is approximately 3.5 miles long and 1.5 miles wide at the widest point. And then our smallest island, Montezuma Towhead, is approximately 1.5 miles long and 0.4 miles wide. So this map shows all six of the study islands. The northernmost um, island is Buck Island, and it's outside of Helena, West Helena, Arkansas. And south of that is Montezuma Towhead, um, which is really close by. And then south of that is Jackson Point um, Bar, and that is kind of close to Elaine, Arkansas. And then south of Jackson Point, you can see here the White and Arkansas Rivers entering the Mississippi River. Um, so I selected three islands that were north of where these rivers come in and three islands south of where the Wyden Arkansas rivers come in because I was um, curious if the position of the islands relative to these river inputs would impact the plant communities. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the islands south of river inputs, the first one is Choctaw Bar, which is outside of Arkansas City, Arkansas. And then there's Tarpley Island um, near Lake Village. And then our furthest south island is Lakeport Towhead, south of Greenville, Mississippi. So here's a close up map of Buck Island. Um, it's colored by elevation group so that the darkest green color is high elevation and the lightest green is low elevation. Um, in this elevation, it ranges about 20, 20 ish feet on the islands. Um, so it's not a huge elevation difference, but it can make a big difference in how long different areas of the island are flooded per year. Um, so our tracks from the flora are in red here on the map. And then um, I have points for the plots that we surveyed on the island. Too. And um, yeah, so this island is in Phillips County. It's owned by Arkansas Game and Fish, and it's approximately 155 years old. Um, and it's mostly forested, as you can see in this picture on the right. Here's one of our plots on the island. Montezuma Towhead, south of that, um, is also a largely forested island. Here's a picture of a very, very viney section of the island that would be very hard to walk through. It's also in Phillips County and it's owned by the Helena Port Company. And it's about 191 years old. It's one that formed behind a steamboat wreck. Um, and you can see here again, the elevation sections of the island and our tracks. And then we have Jackson Point Bar. Um, it is a little bit different than Buck and Montezuma. It has a lot of sandy habitat that you can see pictured here. Um, these habitats are really cool. They're like sand dunes. Um, and they have this really cool plant that I like, um, winged pigweed, Cycloma atroplicifolia. It's one of my favorites. Although now in weekly, Weekly is 2022 that he just put out. It's now Dysphania atroposifolia. Um, and so this island is 
also in Phillips County. It's owned by the Jackson Point Hunting Club that um, they allowed us access to the island and it's um, less than 80 years old, so it's pretty young. And then uh, we have Choctaw Bar Island. This is our largest island. Uh, it's in Deshaies County, Arkansas. It's uh, owned by the Arkansas Game and Fish and it's approximately 145 years old. Um, it has a lot of different habitat types on it um, because of how large it is. It has some of those cool sand dune habit habitats as well. Um, here's a picture of part of the island. And then we have Tarpley Island, which is largely forested, kind of like Buck and Montezuma. Um, it's in Chico County, Arkansas, and it's owned by the Woodstock Hunting Club, and it's about 85 years old. So here's a picture of a little pond in the middle of the, the island that had some cool plants around it. And then the last island is Lake Port Towhead. It's our second largest island, um, and it's in Washington County, Mississippi. So it's our only non-Arkansas island. It's owned by the American Bar Hunting Club, and it's approximately 120 years old. Um, this picture was taken by Richard Abbott, and I really like it. I think it's really pretty. You can see some of the sand dunes here. Um, and this was just a little kind of cove area of the island. Um, and then you can see really tiny are me and Katie um, out there in the field. So this is just a summary of the flora methods. Um, so we conducted the flora in the summer and fall of 2020 and the spring of 2021, conducted meandering surveys. We kind of looked at maps ahead of time to make sure um, we would visit all the unique habitat types and areas on the islands. Um, and we collected every species we encountered on each island. So for some species, we um, collected it six times if it was on every island. And here's a picture of Katie Sims with a bunch of collection bags on Choctaw Island. And then for the second chapter, the plot work, um, we followed Carolina Vegetation Survey Protocol. Um, we had 10 by 10 meters squared for 100 meters squared, uh, 10 by 10 meter plots, which were 100 meters squared. Um, the plots were randomly stratified within island elevation groups, high, middle, and low. We recorded species presence and cover, woody stem counts, um, and measurements at breast height, and then we collected soil data as well. And here's a picture of me on one of our plots on Black Island. So of course we had a lot of fun doing the field work on the islands. Um, I have a lot of pictures here. Uh, there's a plastic horse that I found on an island that I named Cyparis. We would find all sorts of interesting items or trash washed up on the islands from the river. Um, of course, there were lots of beautiful sunsets on the river. Here, we're in a canoe on the very first day that we went out to an island, we went out with the Quapaw Canoe Company. So this is us um, outside of Montezuma Island. And then um, here's me and Katie on our river boat. Um, driving the boat was usually a lot of fun. But we also had um, some boat issues that caused us some stress. Um, and so here's some pictures of those boat mishaps here, um, barges, there barges passed by that caused really big waves and filled up our boats so that when we got back at the end of a long field day, we had to scoop out the water with Tupperware and, and a small cooler. Here's Travis and Richard, um, we're having to paddle back to the boat ramp this day because the motor wasn't working. And then in this picture, here's a flying Asian carp. They were really common um, on the side channels um, of the river and they would jump into our boat sometimes. Um, and then here's me and Katie getting, 
getting splashed by some water on a particularly rough water day when the waves are really large. Um, we ultimately had to turn back that day because it just wasn't safe to get to the island. And then of course we had usual field work negatives that many of you have probably experienced like poison ivy and stinging nettle, mosquitoes, chiggers, wasp stings. <laughs> um, but despite all that, I still think back fondly on all this field work and, and, and I'm very grateful for all of the experiences. So after the field seasons were done, um, it was time to identify a lot of plant specimens. This took many hours, much longer than I expected. And I spent a large portion of my non-field season time identifying plants. Um, so here are Travis and Katie in the herbarium as we sort the 2020 specimens um, by family. And then on the right is a picture I took under the microscope of a mensa canadensis specimen that I thought was really pretty. Um, you can see the the uh, yellow gland dots under the microscope there. And then here's a picture of a croptolon specimen. Uh, we're measuring the diameter of the involucre is important to ID the species. And then on the right here is an unknown species. It's a, it's a vegetative specimen we collected in a plot and no one in the lab can figure it out. So if you have any ideas, uh, please let me know. <laughs> Now for the plot work, we gave um, each plot a general habitat or structure classification. Um, so I'm gonna go through these now to show you some of the variety of community types on the islands. So this first is what we termed a vine land where vines were taking over um, everything in the plot. So in this plot picture, it's mostly morning Whoa. glory vines. And you can kind of see, barely see the rope that we pulled out here to delimit the plot. And then we have a um, sparsely vegetated plot, which is self-explanatory. Um, there's not a lot of vegetation here. So many of the high elevation areas that were very sandy had little vegetation like this. And then we have, um, Herbaceous plots, which were dominated by herbaceous species, didn't have a lot of tree or shrub cover. <clears throat> and these were also common in the sandy areas. And then we had forest plots, which would have a nearly closed canopy, um, lots of trees, and often not a lot of herbaceous plant cover. And then um, woodland plots where the trees are a little sparser and a more open canopy and some more herbaceous um, plant cover. And then uh, shrubland, which was dominated by shrubs. And then there were some other community types or habitats that were not captured in our plots. Um, and one of those is um, a slough. So the islands, a lot of the islands had slough areas um, where water kind of cut through the island and sometimes that would dry up um, later in the year as the river levels went down. And so we went to these areas on the islands during the flora a lot to look for maybe some wetland species that might be more protected um, in the slough on the interior of the island compared to the outside. Um, and we found some cool plants here like uh, Marsilia. And then there's also some um, ephemeral or um, temporary swamp areas on some of the islands. So these swamps would dry up some as river levels decreased later in the year, um, but in the spring and early summer, um, they would be like um, this, where they would have limna floating on them. And these were mostly dominated by um, swamp privet forest era um, shrubs. And then the sand dune habitat, we did capture this habitat often during plot work. Um, 
it would usually be categorized as herbaceous or sparsely vegetated. But I wanted to emphasize it because this habitat I think is really cool and has not been um, really formally described in the literature. So many of the high elevation areas of certain islands would have large sand deposits where a different a different suite of species would grow than in the forested areas of the islands. The sun got really hot in these areas and it kind of would feel like a desert sometimes, but it's um, they were really beautiful as well. Um, sadly, some of these areas you can see pictured on this bottom image have been taken over by Bermuda grass. And then I just wanted to show you some pictures of some of my favorite island plants. Um, so here on the left is hibiscus lasiocarpus, um, of course, really beautiful flower and kind of like fuzzy leaves that I like. There's Scrofularia marylandica, um, Portulaca pilosa, which I thought the fruit were really cool on it and they would kind of grow in the sandier areas. And then Physalis mollis is my all time favorite island plant. I really like Physalis, the flowers on them, how they're kind of hanging like bells. And this one was my favorite Physalis species. And here's Impatience capensis, um, which of course have pretty flowers and really cool fruit. And then Apios americana, um, this pea vine with really pretty flowers and Lobelia cardinalis. We saw lots of other cool taxa on the islands too, besides plants. Here's a praying mantis on a um, cycloloma plant. There are lots and lots of toads that we encountered and lots of really cool fungi. I think it would be cool for someone to go out and catalog the different fungi on the islands. We saw beaver evidence a lot like uh, beaver homes or trees that had been um, gnawed on by beavers. We saw a red bat one time in a plot pictured here. It was really cute. Um, here's some dead gar that died after the slough that they were living in dried up and stranded them there. So after all the field work and plant ID, um, here are our main flora results. So from 2,310 collected vascular plant specimens. We identified 489 taxa, and that includes four infraspecific taxa. Um, those taxa were within 89 families and 283 genera. About 22% er, about of the species were non-native. We found 262 county records. Um, 130 in Phillips, 64 in Deshaies, 24 in Chico, and 42 in Washington. Um, and 109 species of our full taxa list were found on all six islands. So that's about 22.5% of our species were found on all six islands. And 134 species were found on only a single island. So that's about 28.3%. Some of our notable island finds. Um, we found five state records in Arkansas and seven state records in Mississippi. And here on the right, I've put um, maps of their previous known ranges for all those state records and have them listed out here. Um, and then we found nine taxa that are tracked in Arkansas by the Heritage Commission and then five taxa that are tracked in Mississippi by the Mississippi Natural Heritage Program. And here's some pictures of some of our cool finds. So Sisymbrium lo lois cellii is in the Brassicaceae family. It's a Mississippi state record, um, non-native to the states. And then this uh, top picture is Equisetum variegatum, um, which was an Arkansas state record that we found on Buck Island. And if you look at its map at the top here, you can see that it normally has a much more northern 
range. So that one was a really cool find. Um, it had kind of floated down the river to land on Buck Island. We collected that specimen in December. So when it was a little um, colder, maybe it was able to survive then better. And then uh, Bergia texana, we found on Montezuma, pictured here, and it's um, an S2 species in Arkansas in the Latinaceae family. So from the um, plot work, uh, analyzing the results of the plot work required not only a lot of plant identification of unknown specimens that were collected in the plots, but also a lot of statistical data analysis in our studio. Um, so from the plot work, we recorded 276 species um, in a total of 59 plots. So we captured about 57% of the total island flora in the plots. Um, we found that after ana data analyses that elevation, island position, um, relative to the White and Arkansas River inputs, tree cover, percent tree cover, and soil variables are all influential um, for the island plant communities. So they're, um, those are all in informative factors that um, help determine the different plant community types on the islands, and they also have an effect on diversity. And we found that diversity is um, highest at middle elevations on the islands and on islands that are north of the confluence points of the White and Arkansas rivers. So in this picture, um, this picture is of our most diverse plot. So diversity takes into account species richness and individual species covers. So this plot was on Jackson Point. It was a low elevation plot, had a sandy loam soil type, and it was a forest slash woodland plot with a lot of herbaceous cover. Um, and we recorded 74 species. Um, in this 10 by 10 meters squared plot. And these are pictures of our most species rich plot with 79 species. And you can see here, it's kind of part woodland or part shrubland and part herbaceous plot. Um, this was on Lakeport and it was a middle elevation plot. Um, and it also had a sandy loam soil type. So this was a figure I made for my thesis of the most common species on the islands. So the bigger the box um, means the more common that species was in the plots. And then it's separated by the growth form. So we have the woody vine species in the top left and then graminoid and herbaceous vine and shrub um, on the top right, orb on the bottom right and tree on the bottom left. Um, so Ipomia lacunosa, the a morning glory, and Celtis lavigata, um, hackberry, were encountered the most frequently in the plots, with each of those species occurred in 34 of the 59 plots. Celtis lavigata was the most abundant woody species that we encountered, with about 8% of the total plot cover accounted for by Celtis labigata. And Cynodon dactylon or Bermuda grass was the most uh, abundant herbaceous species. Um, and it, it accounted for about 10% of the total herb herbaceous plant cover. So in these pictures, you can see some of these common plants dominating. So in the top left, you, you can see a lot of Bermuda grass here. Um, this top right picture, you can see a lot of Sicius angulatus, um, burr cucumber vine um, taking over this area. And then the bottom right picture, you can see a lot of swamp privet, forestiera, acuminata, um, and kind of this would have been a low elevation area of an island. And then in the bottom left, there's a lot of 
Black Willow, um, Salix Nigra, um, in this section of island. So we didn't find like one single factor that has a huge impact on all the communities, but rather several factors together that shape the communities. Uh, we found a lot of diverse and interesting communities on these islands that should be further studied and described. Um, and so I think that with um, additional future work, some patterns that I've discussed in this thesis may become clearer. Um, and I think that the islands are an important place to start this um, research because they make up a large portion of the river's modern floodplain. Um, so ultimately the lower Mississippi River is a complex environment that <clears throat> I think deserves more study and recognition as an important ecosystem. So in these pictures, I've just kind of put a variety of the different habitats of the islands. Okay, so I have a lot of people to thank. Um, on my committee, I have uh, Dr. Scott Mangan, pictured here on the left, um, Dr. Richard Abbott, um, Dr. Travis Marcico, and then my lab mates, Katie Sims, Matthew Jones, um, Brendan Kosnick, and Ben Benton. Um, I'd like to thank the Superb Scholarship Program for uh, funding me at Arkansas State and the Arkansas Native Plant Society um, for a scholarship as well. The, the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission helped fund the FOAR project and we sent our duplicate specimens to them. The Arkansas Game and Fish Commission um, owned a couple of the islands and allowed us access. And then the iNaturalist community, I'd like to thank um, because you know a lot of people on there have helped us ID uh, several of our specimens. So Eric already mentioned this at the beginning, but Katie Sims, one of my lab mates, is talking about her phenology island work on August 13th. And here's a picture of Matthew and Katie counting um, fruits and flowers on tiny uh, malugo plants for the phenology project. All right, so thank you for your time. I'll, let, I'll now take any questions yeah thank you grace <clears throat> that was wonderful really appreciate you taking the time to put all that together and uh, to share with us uh, about your research um there um, on the lower mississippi river islands uh, as grace mentioned she's uh, accepting questions if anyone um would like to um, uh, unmute your mic or you can put your question in the chat it uh, looks like we already have one uh let's see uh jmck asks uh, can we see the unknown plant again Oh, yes. <laughs> I can just um, leave that up there for people to look at. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe uh, JMCK might have a comment or two. Um, Deborah Grimm asks, does island age affect diversity? So from what I found, it doesn't, um, there's not really a clear relationship with island age and diversity. Um, some of the, you know, the youngest islands, like Jackson Point was one of our youngest islands and it was really diverse. And Montezuma, our oldest island was also really diverse. Um, so no, we didn't really find a pattern with that. Okay. Did you happen to notice um, any changes as you moved up or down different latitudes um, in plant communities? So um, it ha had more to do with what habitat types were present on each island. So like, um, Jackson Point and Choctaw and Lakeport all had that sandy dune community type um, and that resulted in them having 
kind of different species than the other three islands that were more forested. And we didn't really find that um, it had to do with latitude specifically. Okay. Uh, Dr. Marcico, who I know you know, asks, Grace, can you speak to the disturbance from floods and how that might impact diversity? Yeah, so, um, so these islands get flooded every year, but not the entirety of the island. So the, the low elevation parts of the islands will get flooded every year and the, high, the highest elevations will only get flooded um, maybe every few years when the floodwaters are really high. Um, and so um, certain islands too, depending on the range of elevation are affected differently by floods. So the, the islands south of the confluence point of the White and Arkansas rivers we found that they were, had lower uh, um, diversity than the islands that were north of the river inputs. And I think it's because the islands below the river inputs were have um, higher river levels for longer periods of time in the year. So because those, those islands receive um, water from the White and Arkansas rivers as well, the river levels are generally higher. Um, and so, especially those low elevation areas on the islands were less diverse than um, the islands north of the confluence point. Uh, Diana asks, uh, now I'm not sure how to quite pronounce this, Tucrium or okay. Stachys? Do you know if it was Lamaceae or Asteraceae? Um, so I think it's, uh, it's more asteraceous than um, Lamiaceae. It has a circular stem, but I've, I have looked at both Tucrium and Stachys species as possibility for it, and um, those didn't, didn't really match the specimen. Okay. Uh, David Darby asks, were there many uh, pteridophytes uh, on, present on the islands? Um, not many, but we did find some. Um, the equicetums, we had some of those. Yeah. We had the Marsilia um, species of fern. And then we had Osmunda. Um, we had one specimen of a splenium um, on Montezuma. Um, and then some Azola we found on a couple islands too. And I think that was all, all of the fern and fern allies. Uh, is there any conclusion that can be drawn on like the different types of plants you found there as far as, you know, ferns versus, the, you know, seed bearing plants versus, uh, or is it, you know, I know it just maybe it just has more to do with the habitat present, like you said, or is, are there any other conclusions that can be drawn by the the types of uh, plants you're finding there. Um, that has maybe to do. I may. I'm wondering more with the high, uh, hydrology or relationship, you know, flooding and that sort of stuff. Um, I'm sorry. I don't. <laughs> I don't That's think. okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know we talked about how the you know flooding and the disturbance might affect you know. Um, diversity along the, the edges versus the inner part of the island. I didn't know if there was anything else that flooding might affect as far as like, you know, spore bearing versus seed bearing, but maybe not. Maybe there's just oh. no, no, nothing, no conclusions to be drawn there. So. Well, we did find, um, well, they're just, they're, most of our plants were seed bearing. We didn't really have many um, spore bearing. And then as far as gymnosperms goes, we, we found two juniper trees on the islands, on two different islands um, at really high elevations. And then we found seedlings of um, taxodium, but mm. only ever seedlings. We never found big trees of cypress because mm. um, we're thinking they just couldn't tolerate the flooding disturbance. They maybe like to be, you know, have wet feet throughout the whole year and not, you know, have the water go up and down a lot. Gotcha. 
think, um, and we found on the lower elevations, there were um, more annual species, you know, fast growing that could maybe um, uh, grow better in those more disturbed environments, um, you know, have their full growing season. Um, then versus the high elevations that would have more perennial species. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, and JMCK asks, um, how about Heliopsis? Um, I'm not sure if that's a question about whether you found any or if that's a question about the, the plant specimen, which I guess that's not Heliopsis there. Um, he's probably asking about the, whether you saw any. Um, we didn't, we didn't have any Heliopsis, no. Okay. Actually, this is John Michael. That was a question about Heliopsis. I don't remember, I don't remember if it's opposite. I think it may be. Uh, it's an aster that is uh, conventional for riparian zones. Not necessarily sandy in my experience, but just. Okay. Yeah, I haven't looked into that species or that group, so. I'm gonna oh, for this. <laughs> for the unknown. Oh, I see. You're talking about this specimen, the, the, the one that was unknown. Okay. <clears throat> I see where you're going. I had Heliopsis confused with a different genus altogether. I think I was thinking of Heliotrope for some reason. Um, see, and John Michael also asked, did the age of the forest differ significantly from the island age? Meaning, were there trees whose size suggested ages over 150 years? Uh, that age exceeds the U.S. Forest Service standards for old growth minimum on riparian pioneer forest, and I would expect impending compositional shifts uh, to heavy seeded stuff unless there are they are experienced delayed succession. Yeah, so I, I don't think that the forests were different from the island age. Um, the forests grew on the islands after the sediment built up for the islands. It wasn't like they were cut off from the mainland in the case of these islands anyways um there were some large trees but um i don't think they were older than 150 years old or anything like that um yeah okay uh Suresh Sabeti, who's given a webinar for us before last year on uh, oaks in arkansas asks is there any island size effect in diversity? Um, yeah, so as with island age, we also didn't really find an effect with island size and diversity. Um, I did expect it to have more of an effect, but we didn't find any. Um, our most diverse island, um, as far as number of species found in a area um, was Montezuma, which is also our smallest island. Um, and then Choctaw, our largest island, um, was one of our less diverse islands in terms of number of species for the island size or, you know, the diversity of the pots and things like that. Uh, a few more questions here. Let's see. Uh, Dr. Marcico says major disturbances are probably too significant. Big trees are more prone to being uprooted. The river moves fast when the water is up and can pull out whole parts of islands. Of the island islands. Uh, there are also large log jams and other interesting sections. Uh, Sherry Lee asks, what invasive species were present and did diversity increase from north to south on the islands? So um, invasive species, we, we had Bermuda grass was the main one. Um, we had some Chinese privet was also pretty common. Um, we had a balloon vine, the Cardiospermum helicacabum. We found it on certain islands taking up really large areas it would grow fast and cover large areas. Um, we found Japanese hops on an island, um, unfortunately. 
Um, that one wasn't a state record because Brent Baker had found it, uh, I think in 2014 on a more Northern Island. Um, but we did record it on another, a more Southern Island, meaning that maybe it's working its way down the river. Um, and there were some other invasive species too. The, um, but it was, I was a little bit afraid when I started this project that the islands might be more invaded, um, have a lot of invasive species covered because of the amount of disturbance, but we didn't find that. Um, there were still a lot of um, native species and native species cover on the islands. Um, and then did diversity increase from north to south? Um, it, it did not, no, it didn't increase from north to south. There wasn't a, a pattern with latitude. Okay, that sounds like, yeah, the diversity is more of a pattern with the disturbance from the, the hydrology. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Do we have any other questions for Grace? Some good questions, Some good info. Oh, okay, Jack, uh, or John Michael, sorry, asked, did you see Opuntia on the island, prickly pear? We never did, no, we never saw any Opuntia. Um, it just seems like some of the sandy habitats might be able to su support it, but maybe not long-term, maybe it can't, can't survive the large floods, and so that's why we didn't find it, maybe. Hmm. Okay. All right, last call for questions. We're at 10.53, so I'm clocking in just under an hour. Uh, John Michael says, found on islands and bars of Red River. And he also says, great job, Grace. Thank you. Um, yeah. All right, well, thank you again, Grace. That was amazing. We really appreciate you sharing your research and your knowledge with us. Uh, it looks like a lot of people have found that interesting, including myself. I uh, want to thank everyone else again for being here today. Uh, again, this meeting or this uh, webinar has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel later today. Uh, don't forget that in August uh, on the 13th, uh, Saturday at 10 a.m., Katie Sims, who Grace mentioned, will be talking about her research on tracking the phenology of herbaceous species on Buck Island in the Mississippi River. Uh, again, you can find out more information about the Arkansas Native Plant Society at our website, amps.org. Uh, give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arkansas Native Plant Society, and you can join by going to amps.org slash join. Thank you all very much for being here, and thank you, Grace. Thank you.